ladies and gentlemen, I, uh, I was, I was for the Iraq invasion, but I'm against the Cuban embargo. I've supported capital punishment, but I think there's too much fighting in hockey. I was for profiling at airports post 9-11, and I supported harsh interrogation methods at Guantanamo Bay for presumed terrorists, pretty conservative stuff. But I believe in the legalization of both pot and prostitution. I want to end the SAT, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, but I think that we need to continue teaching cursive writing to high school students. I'm for breaking up Pennsylvania's state monopoly on the sale of alcohol, but I'd like to see the U.S. Treasury discontinue the manufacture of the copper penny. Those are all my opinions, or at least they were at one time, as expressed in columns that I've written. Maybe at this point I should be saying, I'm Michael Smirconish and I approve this message. <laughs> but hard to classify, don't you think? And yet, it explains the title of the book that I'm launching today, Clowns to the Left of Me, Jokers to the Right, American Life in Columns. Yes, I borrowed with permission that 1972 Steelers Wheel hit song that is also the opening every hour for my Sirius XM POTUS radio program. I should point out that I'm not making a penny, copper or otherwise, on this project. I'm thrilled that all author proceeds will benefit the Children's Crisis Treatment Center, which provides social services to kids who are the victim of trauma. And so that's a cause all of you are supporting by being here today. My wife, thank you for that. My, my, wife, my wife, Lavinia, who is here and, and front and center, is, is on the CCTC board, and I applaud her work and the work of everybody else who's involved in that cause. So the book is a collection of 100 of what I consider to be my more memorable columns published from the 1,047, by my count, from the Philadelphia Daily News and Inquirer between 2001 and 2016. I am extremely grateful to the Daily News and Inquirer for giving me permission to publish this work, and I am very grateful to Temple University Press, now that you see it, they did a spectacular job. Thank you, Temple. Thank you, Inquirer. Thank you, Daily News. I have, uh, I, I have added a fresh afterword for each one of those hundred columns that are in the book, and I have recorded both the columns and the afterwords for release by Audible, which comes out Friday. Look out if my radio producer, TC, ever releases the outtake reel. I'll be done. <laughs> I remember being so honored in 2001 when Zach Stahlberg, the editor of the Daily News, first offered me a column at the News, and likewise years later when Brian Tierney invited me to come over to the Philadelphia Inquirer. I had majored in both government and journalism at Lehigh University, so it felt like uh, a natural calling for me. I also remember the newspaper having some fun at the expense of my last name at the time of a launch, which I think was a play on McDonald's, Do You Want That Supersized? Getting a column, however, was actually not the first time that I wrote for the Philadelphia Daily News. And something that I'd forgotten until I, I, I climbed through the archives of the newspapers is that back in 1985, at the conclusion of my first year of law school at Penn, I published an essay in the Daily News under the headline, America Offers Opportunity to Those Who Work. In the book, I revisit that essay like I revisit everything else that I've published. You might be interested to know that I take issue with some of what I wrote even back in 1985. I still think that America is a land of opportunity, but that luck has a lot to do with the equation. And that was a large part of the fun for me, exploring opinions that I had offered over the course of 15 years, revisiting them, and determining which I thought stood the test of time. I joined immediately after September 11, and the events of 9-11 occupied more of my time in the ensuing 15 years than any other singular event. As a matter of fact, my very first column argued that Rudy Giuliani was well suited to be the nation's first secretary of, of Homeland Security. Um, 
I now disagree with that opinion, having nothing to do with his representation of the president, but in recognition of the fact that I thought Tom Ridge was a hell of a Secretary of Homeland Security and our own governor here in Pennsylvania to boot. Writing a column, I learned, is much more difficult than you might think when you spend just a couple of minutes quickly reading the end product. My work on radio and television tends to be more free-flowing, organic, extemporaneous, but writing a column has forced me, or at least it should, to be more deliberative. And in reflecting on 15 years worth of columns, here's what I've come to recognize. I have been right, I have been wrong, mostly I have been fortunate. I mean, some things I've nailed. Uh, I wanted us to invade the sovereignty of Pakistan long before we knew that bin Laden was hiding at Abbottabad. I called BS on the Duke lacrosse case in a column from the get-go. In 2012, I wrote that Chris Christie better run for president quickly or he'll flame out, and that was before Bridgegate. Like I said, there's also been plenty that I've gotten wrong. I once entertained a conspiracy theory about the bombing of the Murrah building in Oklahoma City, had myself convinced that McVeigh and Nichols had support from the Iraqis. My first reaction to the Citizens United case was positive, yikes. And, ladies and gentlemen, I said many, many times in print, on radio, and on television that Donald Trump would never run, much less win, the presidency of the United States. Here's something else about writing a weekly column. You have to weigh in on everything. Women and what their tattoos say, what to build at ground zero, kids and their trophies, scandal in the church, scandal at Penn State, even the zoo balloon. I was never a fan. Too many gaper delays on the Schuylkill, attributable to the <laughs> balloon. The Boy Scouts, Terry Schiavo's end of life, summer jobs, whether to permit the Barnes Foundation to move into the city, and what's the best location for the Rizzo statue. I've weighed in on all of it. And looking back, there are some things I have no idea what I was thinking. <laughs> what, do, what does that even mean? I once took umbrage with a move to make the Miss America pageant more about scholarship than beauty. Long before the era of hashtag Me Too, I may or may not have written these words. Quote, if the pageant wants to become a televised Mensa meeting, that's their choice. But I have a hunch America wouldn't mind a little more of an old-fashioned beauty pageant, bring back the busty baton twirler. <laughs> Until then, Burt Parks will continue to roll over in his grave. Sometimes I've had the privilege of breaking news. I was honored when the father of a fallen Marine asked me to tell his true family story. This is Lance Corporal Matthew Snyder. He died on March 3rd, 2006 in Operation Iraqi Freedom. You might remember this. After Matthew died, members of the so-called Westboro Baptist Church showed up at his funeral holding despicable signs saying things like, God hates fags. His father, Al Snyder, had to endure those taunts while burying his son and maintaining a secret of his own, and that is that Al is gay, a fact known to his now deceased son. He kept that secret all the while he fought through the Supreme Court of the United States against Westboro Baptist and I felt humbled that he allowed me to tell that story. This is Al with his then partner, Walt. The two sat together at the Supreme Court of the United States while that case was argued. Walt passed soon thereafter. By the way, my friend Al Snyder is here tonight. There he is. Hey, Al. Thank you so much for being here and for allowing me to tell your story. I really appreciate it. Like I said, right, wrong, and fortunate. Right place, right time. Sometimes I've even felt a little Forrest Gumpish. And often there were many backstories that never made their way into print. I was fortunate in January of 2002 to accompany United States Senator Arlen Specter, a good friend of mine, to Cuba for a meeting that he was having with Fidel Castro. My observations from that trip were a week-long daily news feature that began with a cover story. By the way, look carefully, and I think Shane Inspector gets the photo credit. Am I right, Shane? 
And who'd have thought? You missed your calling. <laughs> Castro may have served me my first mojito, but we argued about world events. And what I most remember, and not published in the Daily News, although I should have, is that at the end of the night, knowing that I'm a cigar smoker, he presented me with a box of my favorites, which at the time were Trinidad's. And then he signed the top of the box. When I got home, I showed it to my wife. Lavinia was ecstatic. I couldn't understand why. And she said, well, you know, the kids' school auction is coming up. This will be fabulous. Of course, I had to explain to her that it was then the most valuable item in my estate and probably still is. I conducted President Barack Obama's first live radio interview from the White House. That, too, was great column fodder. I'd been promised 30 minutes one-on-one -on -one and that my radio interview would be televised live on CNN, MSNBC, and Fox. Many suggested questions that I should ask of the president. I thought I'd prepared for every eventuality, but I'd overlooked one. And that is that the president of the United States would arrive early, putting me in the position of having to make small talk because, as we say, you don't want to leave it in the locker room. Well, I reflected on the fact that the night before, at family dinner, one of the boys, and all three are here tonight, maybe one of them will fess up, said, Dad, make sure you ask the president about the Book of Secrets. And I said, okay, remind me. And they said, well, you know, Dad, when a president gets elected, he gets the Resolute Desk, and he gets the Book of Secrets, which explain who killed Kennedy, what's in Area 51, and did we really land on the moon? And I said, okay, I'll try and work it in, but I don't know that I'll have the opportunity. You know where this is going. President sits down, we each extend a hand, I say to him, Mr. President, What's in the Book of Secrets? He quickly responds, I'd tell you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> now, the interview then proceeds, and, and I achieved my purpose. I did not create any YouTube moments. Uh, went home with my head held high. But the following day, I could not wait to see, after 30 minutes of substantive dialogue with the President of the United States, what will the print coverage be like? The Associated Press had somebody in the room the whole time, and there was their headline. Obama mum on Book of Secrets. <laughs> and that was the totality of what they wrote about that encounter. Election night 2016, never forget it, spent nine hours on CNN's set as a panelist with Anderson Cooper. 13 million Americans watched us. That's more than the white Ford Bronco chase. That's more than Princess Diana's funeral. That's more than Michael Jackson's acquittal. When the campaign ended, I joked with Sean Spicer that I had gotten him his job as White House press secretary. And he knew exactly of what I spoke because we often sparred on Saturday mornings and I knew and could document the president's having watched those episodes. That's why it was kind of interesting that on a Friday morning, 9 a.m., just about one year ago, Spicer invited me into the White House to visit him in the West Wing for an off-the-record conversation, 9 to 10 a.m. And I remember upon entering his office, he made it clear that at 10 a.m. he had an appointment with the President of the United States. We had a very pleasant conversation. I knew it was time to leave when Sarah Huckabee Sanders poked her head into the room. Extended greetings left. By the time that I got back to uh, my hotel, there was breaking news, legitimate breaking news, that Sean Spicer had either just been fired or he had quit meaning that I was the last appointment that he had in the White House. Yet more good column fodder. In 2017, a year ago, I conducted Bill Cosby's only pre-trial media interview. This was before trial number one. The interview generated huge attention. The biggest revelation that the media picked up on and that I wrote about in my own column was the fact that Bill Cosby had revealed to me that he would not take the stand in his own defense, which turned out to be true. But more interesting, and not revealed in the column, was what happened before the interview. The invitation to interview Cosby had come completely out of the blue when one day I was standing in a CVS line to pick up a prescription for my 87-year-old father. And so when the call came in, I quickly explained to his PR flack that I couldn't speak because I was picking up a prescription for dad. When the phone rang later that afternoon, there were two people at the other end of the line, Bill Cosby and his public relations person. Cosby, wishing to ingratiate himself to me, began to lecture me 
on how to properly medicate someone who's older. <laughs> Consider the irony, he was about to go on trial. By, by the way, you'll be interested to know, you'll be interested to know that Dr. Huxtable is a fan of homeopathic remedies, or so he told me. <laughs> Many celebrity moments have been column worthy, but I have most enjoyed writing about characters, many from Philadelphia, and when I use it, it's a term of endearment. And I've enjoyed writing about plain old everyday folks, like my friend Steven Singer, who I don't hate, and together selling Never Forget, 9-11 Never Forget pins one at a time. We have raised 500,000 plus dollars for 9-11 charities. By the way, that, that is, that is Stephen presenting a check to Ellen Saracini, who is the widow of Victor, the captain of United Flight 175. And I'm thrilled, Ellen, that you're here tonight. Thank you so, so much for being here. You're a good, good friend. I feel the same way. He was here earlier, but he had to leave. My broadcast mentor, Larry Kane, here in Miami as a cub reporter, with the Beatles on their first tour of the United States. My favorite part of the story, Larry had to be coaxed into making the trip. You know how long we have known each other? We have known each other so long that I was in high school when we met delivering chlorine to his house as a summer job. I'm the guy on the right. It has also been such a privilege for me to know and to write about on multiple occasions the legendary Sid Mark, who is here with his lovely wife, Judy. Sidney, I love you. Thank you for being here. By the way, by the way, it's also his birthday. Happy birthday, Sidney. Thank you. He's like me. He doesn't come out to play all that often. So it means a great deal to me, Sid, that you made this trip. Thank you for that. Thank you, Judy. Another good friend. Pennsylvania's longest serving United States Senator, Arlen Specter. We were always hatching capers together. I so miss the man, his intellect and his ethical code, especially in the time in which we're now living. He was fodder for so many columns that I wrote. So too, two other mentors, legendary trial attorney James E. Beasley Esquire, now the namesake of the Temple University School of Law, mentored me in a legal sense, and someone else right here in this building, City Councilman Thatcher Longstreth, with whom we spent so many fun moments. When you go home and look at the column, you might want to start with my tribute to Thatcher. It's all about a practical joke that together we played, dare I mention him, Dave Singer, who I think is in the building, CCD here, there he is. Uh, I had to make sure, Dave, that that column made the cut. Thank you for your presence. It's a hell of a story. I really enjoyed it. I also wrote about the day that I decided I needed to call Smokin' Joe Frazier just to tell him what he meant to me as I was growing up. But like I said, even though I've written about a lot of celebrities, it's often the private citizen who has a story to tell that I've most enjoyed sharing with readers, like the Yoakum family, Frank, Claire, and their quadruplets. By the way, are Frank and Claire here by any? They are here. How great is that? Thank you. Let me quickly tell the Cliff's Note version of the story. Look at that picture, ladies and gentlemen. In a post-9-11 world, after a high-risk presiden uh, presidency, pregnancy, <laughs> pregnancy, they were flying back to the Philadelphia area. Am I right? It's memory. Was it Arizona? Yes. Arizona. And, and in what I regarded as the ultimate case of airline screening stupidity, the newborns were completely disrobed, not only of all their clothing, but also the medical devices that were then keeping them alive. Now, here's the best part, also in the book. Take a look at them today. Is that the greatest? I love telling that story. I also wrote about a high school, junior high school classmate today, a farmer in Buckingham who grows the best tasting tomato summer after summer. That made for a great Labor Day weekend profile. Bill Maramau, who's here tonight, I think told me, Bill, that was one of the favorite things that I'd been privileged to write that you ever enjoyed. I'll never forget this part. Freddie, who grows these incredible tomatoes, told me the secret is that his plants have brains. Who am I to argue with him? 
Those who are not household names are often the best fodder, like another woman that I was able to write about, Grace Snags, who worked for our family in a domestic capacity for 30 years. And then when she was sick late in life, we experienced a role reversal. We became her caretakers. Grace, whose cousin Ansel is here. Ansel, where are you? Somewhere in the, way in the back. Thank you, Ansel, for being here and allowing me to again tell a brief story about Grace. Grace was from Tobago, had a huge heart, loved to sing red, red wine while doing the laundry. Our three sons, who may or may not care to admit this, sometimes would drop, all in good fun, socks on Grace while she sang, and they had this ongoing banter back and forth. As I wrote about Grace while she was still alive, when she thinks I'm too involved in affairs on the home front, which is often, she'll call me an anti-man, only to hear Grace pronounce it, it's anti-man. She also had a head full of island sayings like, you don't know if the roof leaks until you live inside. I was very proud to pay homage to her and that column struck a chord. It's interesting what readers have responded to. They told me that they loved hearing about Grace and it was a reminder in fact, I should say it this way. Here's what 15 years of writing a column has taught me, that often it's not the political. It's not the front page news that seems to really strike a chord with people. When readers have written to me or stopped me to talk about my work, it's often to discuss the stuff about life. The Seinfeld or Larry David curb your enthusiasm moments that I've been able to tap into which are really not columns about nothing, if you remember the Seinfeld episode, but they're columns about everything. The fabric of our lives not separated by political divide, like family pets, or yard sales, or summer camp, or holiday decorations, all of which I've written about. With regard to the latter, readers seemed struck by my assessment of what the color of your Christmas lights says about you. I once wrote that I grew up in a colored light family, quote, I'm talking big, fat, colored Christmas lights. They were red, they were green, they were orange, they were blue. They were bright, they were gaudy, they were everywhere, they were beautiful, they were Christmas. But then I noted that as an adult, my house is bigger than the one in which I was raised. My car is larger than anything ever driven by my father. I wear clothes that are more expensive than what my parents owned when we were young. And somewhere along the way, we've decided that we are white light people. <laughs> Quote, white lights. Petite, non-offensive, uniform, white lights. The lights of power and prestige, the lights of suburban panache and urban glamour. And then I shared an admission as I wrote. White lights are boring. White lights are sedate. White lights are pretentious, white lights are for fakers, white lights are un-Christmas. And I resolved that I was returning to my colored light roots. Now, of course, after I wrote those words and they were published, I went home and my wife bathed our tree in all white lights, but it made for a great column. Folks, finally, I want to say that it's the sort of column that I've written that has drawn meaningful, heartfelt response. Those subjects about which it seems everybody has an opinion, but not one based on party affiliation or ideology, but something that unites us even when it divides. With today's headlines, it's so easy for us to forget our commonalities, but they're there. And what I found anecdotally through response to my writing is supported in the political science, and that's this that the typical Democrat or Republican has not drifted far away on the issues from the opposition. They've not become more extreme. Sadly, what has happened is that many of us are now thinking worse of the other side. It's become personal along the way. Don't misunderstand. I'm acknowledging our political disagreements, but at our core, we're interested in and strive for, I think, the same things as Americans, good health, long life, the ability to prosper, success for our kids, a few laughs, to be left alone to worship or not, and we want good things for our country. And when I say we want good things for our country, I mean those of us who are Democrats, Republicans, independents, conservative liberals, blue states, and red states. That's the lesson that I hope that you will take away from the book. I have so many to thank, 
I fear that if I try to do so here tonight, I'm going to leave someone out. I don't want to risk doing that where so many who are in the room provided me with such help and guidance. But I acknowledge all those names at the end of the book. Thank you so, so much for being here and to support the launch of the book. I have one more piece of business, and that is to ask Tony Valdez from CCTC to come up and join me. So, two things I want to say. I'm sorry it's so hot in the room. Three things I want to say. The first is, this is a check for $10,000 to CCTC, because I want to make sure that everybody knows I mean what I say. I noticed that that drew tepid applause. Let me see if I can do better. Let me, no, 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 I don't mean that. No, 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 no. No, 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 I mean, no, Tom, I mean with an announcement. I want to make another announcement. So, I think you know part of this. But I did something for the last two weeks on radio, on the POTUS channel, on Sirius XM radio, that I'm really proud of, not so much for myself, but for my listening audience, beyond my wildest dreams. There's a website called Charity Buzz. And Charity Buzz has celebrity moments. I put myself at the C list. Don't think it's gone all the way to my head. But celebrity moments where the so-called celebrity contributes an experience and the benefit for the donor is that they write a check to the charity. So it's win-win. As long as you have a celebrity willing to do something and a person willing to write a check to the charity, then everybody benefits. So two weeks ago on the radio, I launched a charity buzz auction. And here it was. And they tried to talk me out of it initially, um, but they didn't. They were, they were unsuccessful. The opportunity was that Instead of you coming to me and taking a studio tour, because I do that often for charities, I said I would come to your book club anywhere in the United States at my expense for whoever the highest bidder is. And secretly, and TC, my producer, can tell you this, five was the number. In my head, I thought five grand. In fact, my book club members are here tonight. Guys, you'd have gotten the alarm call if one needed to be made. But one didn't need to be made. And today, when the hammer fell, if you can believe this, Lydia of Dallas, Texas, paid $25,000 for me to come to her book club and, and, wait till you hear this, and there was another bidder at 24-5 who got edged out Charlie from Long Island. Now, Tony, I can't completely commit to this. You got the 25. Okay, you got the 10 and the 25. But I can't completely commit to this, but I think Charlie from Long Island, because I told him for 24-5, I'm coming to your house too, and I spoke to him, and he told me that he would do it. I, I have to tread lightly, and I have to wait for Charity Buzz to, uh, to, to make that all happen. So I would love to think that today was a... $60,000 day for CCTC because of all of your support. Thank you very much for being here.